It's time for All Hands on Tech. Climb on board as we explore all the amazing things happening in Nova Scotia's tech sector. Each episode, we'll chat with local experts to uncover the secrets of what makes Nova Scotia the best place for collaboration, innovation, and creativity. All Hands on Tech is proudly produced by Digital Nova Scotia, the industry association for Nova Scotia's growing tech sector. Hello and welcome back to All Hands on Tech. I'm Lena. And I'm Ashley. Having a good public relations strategy is just good business, no matter the industry. And our guest today helps clients reach all of their communications goals, be it through strategy planning, social media, web development, and so much more. Up Public Relations is a full-service PR firm that matches East Coast approachability with their boutique agency feel. We're so excited to welcome Jennifer Ashton and Dennis Mills to the podcast today to talk about PR and specifically what tech companies should keep in mind while building their own PR plans. Welcome. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I think this conversation is going to be obviously beneficial to not only tech companies, but companies, you know, like I said from the beginning, everybody needs a good PR strategy. You're right. So, yeah, exactly. So um, before we get into some of the questions, why don't you just tell us a little bit about up public relations, kind of what you guys do and when you started? Well, as our intro in indicated we are a full service public relations firm Uh, so we do everything from you know from the ground up so strategy and planning to um, social media um, executing all the tactics that come in those uh, strategies and plans could be media relations it could be some branding Um, what else Dennis we do uh, web design Mm -hmm. we do event management we always like to joke it could be everything from a communication strategy to telling you you have spinach in your teeth before you (laughs) go on the camera Um, we do a lot of coaching with our clients as well kind of Uh, helping them see and realize their business goals by being able to tell the story Mm -hmm. and getting their information out into public awareness. Exactly. And media relations is also a a big part of our business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your story? Like I know you started, you said in 2016, how, you know, has it evolved since then? Well, it's evolved quite a bit. It was founded by uh, Kate Elliott, who's mm-hmm. one of our partners, and she's not here today, unfortunately. But she was a straight fresh out of the NSCC public relations program and really wasn't finding in the market what she was looking for in terms of employment. So decided to strike up her own business. Amazing. And so she she did start um, by offering, I think, a lot of social media support initially. And I think back then it was a relatively new game and some people Mm -hmm. were doing it and some people weren't and some people just weren't doing it well. So she was there to offer her support. And then um, Kate and I crossed paths a few years later and joined forces. And then what? And then Kate and I crossed paths. (laughs) Uh, I was working at St. Mary's at the time and St. Mary's was and still continues to be one of our clients. And so Kate and I crossed paths and my time at St. Mary's, I decided I wanted to change. And so I joined the UP team in 2020, okay. 2021. During, yeah, so the, during the COVID pandemic, I made a career change. And so the three of us ever since have been just marching forward. Yeah. And while the three of us are really, you know, the face of the organization, we do work with a lot of independent consultants who help, you know, build that bench strength when we need it. So we have graphic designers and additional strategy help, um, events people, that sort of thing. Okay. So your team has expanded and you do, you offer a lot. Exactly. Yeah. We do. Yeah. And we, you know, we play to our strengths and we know what our limitations are. And that's why we have kind of a circle of colleagues around us to help support um, with capacity or expertise that maybe isn't exactly our individual strong points. Amazing. Yeah. And we have really like in terms of just the types of clients that we've taken on, we have we have work from coast to coast and we continue to um, okay, work with, cool. with yeah. you know, partners in every province. Yeah. Okay. How fun. It is fun. Okay. Never, never the same day. Every day. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know. No. It's exciting, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, I'm excited to tap into some of that expertise, but first I'd love to get to know you guys a little bit better. Sure. So we have okay. some rapid fire questions prepared. Um, I think the first one is fun. Lena, do you want to ask? Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's fun. Um, deal with the PR crisis or deal with a difficult brand leader. Ooh, that's tough. Crisis. I think crisis as well. <laughs> <laughs> Jen and I, Jen and I, tend to like the crisis communications a little really? bit. Really? Yeah. Um, there's an energy and there's a, you know, a strategy that goes into place and seeing that have to, you know, work its way through, work the problem. Yeah, and you you know what you want the end of the story to be, so you work towards that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Maybe not what I expected, but okay. I mean, at least you know what difficult <laughs> brand leader is like there. 
forever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. a crisis can pass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is more effective, uh, an influencer feature or a traditional media feature? Oh. And I know this is probably very specific to like what the feature is or what the company is, but. And depends on the audience try totally. who you're trying to reach. Uh, you're probably not using traditional media to connect with a 16 year old. Right. Um, whereas my 67 year old father is definitely not following an influencer. So I think it really depends on who you're trying to reach. And I think it depends on what metrics you have in place. Like a traditional media placement has um, a higher earned media value mm -hmm. than an influencer would. Okay. Yeah. Depends. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and there's so much versatility, you know, traditional media, you know, you get a story on global news, you've got the video, you can share it on social, mm -hmm. you're on TV. Um, so each comes with its own, um, you know, amount of assets or shareable material and they're different. And I would say one's not better than the other. No, time and place for both, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Right. Okay, good answer. I love it. Yeah. Well, what is your favorite part about operating your business in Nova Scotia? The people. Yeah, absolutely the people. We work with mom and pop shops and we work with medium to large organizations. Academic researchers that are doing mm. unbelievable things. There's so many stories to be told in this province that people so have true. no clue the dynamic work that's happening here. And the personalities are the same through and through. It doesn't, I find the Nova Scotia landscape, um, people don't get kind of the big city, big head mentality. Um, we can walk into rooms with CEOs of companies who are just as comfortable um, with us and with the people around them as somebody who maybe owns a diner. Mm -hmm. it's, and that's what I think is special about the East Coast. It's the approachability and the sense of everyone wanting everyone to lift each other up and it's a real privilege to get to help people tell these stories and define their stories mm -hmm. and there's so many homegrown companies here that are doing big work on the international stage and so to sort of set them up for that success or play a small part in setting them up for that success is really great right and i and i do want to just give a shout out to our members because we have so many amazing members that are doing incredible work here on the east coast too and that's the fun part about my job too is right like you guys getting to getting to chat with you and see what you guys are up to so yeah i do think that storytelling aspect is is really fun. absolutely and we love seeing your members we, yeah we do work with some of your members and we're members obviously ourselves and I think the work that you guys are doing is phenomenal because you get a lot of the word out there for people as well mm -hmm. using your platforms. So I guess that's a thanks from us to you guys yeah. for, for sharing all that information. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. I did throw one last uh, rapid fire question in just for fun. Um, what's your guilty pleasure TV show? <laughs> <laughs> I love all the Real Housewives franchises, oh. and I just started watching the Vanderpump Rules. <laughs> oh my gosh, our colleague Emily is going to love that. I've never watched those, but she talks about Vanderpump Rules, and I don't know what that's about. So when I started at Up, uh, our coworker colleague Kate uh, said that the requirement before my first day was I had to start watching the show Scandal. I was oh. not interested in it. It was not a show that traditionally I would watch. And I was like, I'm not watching Scandal. And she was like, you've got to watch it. You've got to watch it. <laughs> so I so started bad. watching Scandal. And holy, is that that show was wild. So um, wild. It's like, that is, get any crazier? No, we are not PR fixers. So we are not <laughs> Olivia Pope's. That yeah. is not us. Her We're, crisis communication <laughs> is next level. <laughs> yeah. There are days when I'd like to employ her tactics to get stuff done. Um, but uh, so I guess that's probably the guiltiest pleasure I had so far is Scandal. Okay. Um, shows that are close to my heart. I love, you know, Ted Lasso. I mm. just finished White Lotus. Um, oh, that's good. So I'm yeah. kind of on the trendy shows right now. I was going to say that's not really like guilty pleasure. Like no. Ted Lasso, it's so popular. It's almost like one of those ones you're like ashamed to tell people you like to watch. You oh. know what I mean? I don't think I have you don't have one. any that's fair I was gonna say like I watched like love is blind yeah and that's like all of those Netflix now. love shows I'm like oh yeah I'm like I shouldn't start this but <laughs> do you want to watch uh Indian matchmakers really good is it yes. oh yeah watch that on Netflix season okay. two just came out phenomenal 
Okay. So first question, when I think about public relations, I don't automatically associate with tech, but I know that's not the case. Obviously you guys are super involved in technical things, social media. So talk to me about like how closely related and connected the two are in the work that you guys do every day. Sure. One of the most clear cut answers that I could give would be all of us every day have social media platforms on our phones. Mm -hmm. And we wake up in the morning, you check Instagram, you check Twitter, and the entire platform seems to have overnight changed. The way mm -hmm. that you tag, the way that stories go, all of those things. And we're not immune to that. So Instagram, Meta, or Facebook as it's formerly known, um, they're not calling us and saying, heads up for your clients who you're doing an ad buy for tomorrow. We're going to completely change the look, the feel, and mm -hmm. how that works. So we wake up in the morning, we're going to do our ad buy or uh, social media posts or something, and the platform has changed. And so all of a sudden, we're having to quickly adapt, figure out what's changed, how we're using it, inform our client, because they're now not understanding how the platform changes. So we are constantly looking through um, various resources, blogs, and things like that to acclimate ourselves with the changing tech that mm. just is bombarding us from day to day. Um, you know, Twitter has just been a complete yeah. roller coaster. <laughs> I was just going to say, and yeah. the attitudes towards different platforms change. I mean, you look at Twitter, you look at the banning of TikTok, things like that. So things that you recommended last week are right. just all yeah. of a sudden canceled this week. Yeah. And, you know, I don't mean to interrupt it. One thing that I've noticed, too, is like, now like deciding whether you want to keep the blue check or not yep. people are like now on the attack if you have a blue check but mm -hmm. you know it's just yeah it's a lot to yeah <laughs> it is and i think that in one one of the things that covid was really good for is pushing people kind of into the digital sphere mm -hmm. and so you know we do web design um and we do obviously social media but it's also things like helping people put their brands into digital platforms so that they can do some graphic design on their own. Um, that it, wasn't a thing. No, you have, you raise a good point. There was a lot of organizations that we helped during COVID who had to come online and never, it just was not in their scope of services, mm -hmm. but they had no choice. Um, and had these, you know, basically old clip art brands that needed to be digitized yeah. and brought up to speed. And even event management, um, Prior to COVID, we were doing event management in person. Right. And COVID happens and all of a sudden we're on these platforms uh, behind the scenes leading teams calls uh, and doing the switching between speakers and spotlights and Hoping we're not everything works. you know we're not zoom experts <laughs> yeah, exactly. but well hey that's like everybody else <laughs> no. yeah, yeah exactly so, for the best you know, and that was the good thing there was for forgiveness built absolutely. in right <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, it's a very good point you bring up about like digitizing a lot of different businesses as well, because um, we run the TDAP program, which is Tourism Digital Assistance Program. And I think with COVID, we saw that so many tourism businesses in Nova Scotia did not know what to do because they didn't have online booking, e-commerce. And I know you work with um, quite a few tourism businesses yeah. um, to help them digitize. And, you know, we get emails every day from these business owners about how thankful they are for the work that you do with these businesses mm -hmm. to um, put them in the map to foreign tourists. So, and who would have thought that you need tech so much in the tourism industry? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that program, we saw firsthand the benefits that that gave to local businesses, and it was just fantastic. And you're right, we were able to help um, people reach so much more and take the intimidation factor away from it, mm -hmm. too. I think mm -hmm. um, the way, you know, we set uh, businesses up for success, it is so that they can manage it on their own um, eventually or soon, depends on how comfortable they are with that. And so that they're not tied to paying somebody external to do it so that, right. you know, because these these small organizations don't have huge budgets to mm -hmm. employ somebody like that or the resources internally. So if we can make it as simple as possible for mm -hmm. them to, you know, hand it off and um, thrive on their own, we, we want to do that. And I think one of the things to, to Jen's point about the impact Digital Nova Scotia had on, on businesses through that program is, um, there's a trusted uh, organization vouching for uh, the b small businesses like ourselves. So, you know, we're a business, we're going out, we're pitching, we're mm -hmm. trying to get work. Uh, and to have a program that created that safe space to have introductions with a PR firm like UP, uh, it gave us the ability to have those conversations without trying to, quote unquote, sell the mm -hmm. client because they knew that we were there for them. Right. And there wasn't that fear of, 
is this website actually supposed to be that much money or whatnot? Because there was a trust and um, that program was just phenomenal for keeping so many tourism based businesses afloat. Um, so I think that we collectively join with those businesses to say a huge thank you for that. It was, it was an amazing program. Well, that's amazing to hear. <laughs> and I don't know, I never mentioned it off the top, but, uh, Lena manages that program. So yeah. thank nice you, to Lena. hear. Great job. <laughs> well, we got to give our thanks to also tourism Nova Scotia, who really, um, puts in a lot of time and effort to mm -hmm. make sure that our participants have a great user experience and that feeling of overwhelm that, um, there's so many different platforms, so many different, mm -hmm. uh, success measures to keep track of um, and I'm I'm so glad that we have partners like you in the community who come together to reduce some of that uh, stress from our entrepreneurs so they can focus on other parts of their business absolutely so you have touched on a little bit on this uh, question already as a PR agency how do you keep up with all the innovation in tech and how do you advise a client uh, which online spaces are best fit for their business yeah, so as Dennis mentioned, it is a lot of on-the-fly stuff. Like, mm -hmm. we're reading it on the news feeds like everybody else is. I mean, obviously, it's our responsibility to keep up to date and to do those deeper dives beyond the 140-character tweets or whatever it is <laughs> up to now. 280. Yeah, 280. Yeah, exactly. So um, we, you know, dive in when we need to. Um, in terms of advising the client on which online spaces and is a best fit, it really has a lot to do with their own capacity. Mm -hmm. mm. I think one of the... One of the things that we really value is while we may be learning with you the new platform that just came out yesterday or the changes, um, we can see oftentimes down the road and we have a good understanding of the implications of our actions today on your audience or on your business or your reputation. And so before we're advising a client to make a decision or to implement a tactic we've thought through what that means for them um, we often have an issues management plan in place in case something goes awry but that's the benefit that we often are bringing is sure we're learning we're staying up to date we're doing professional development reading um, have have colleagues that are finger to the pulse at all times on one specific issue that we call upon uh, and we come together and our strength is really kind of hugging the the client to make sure they're protected and prepared for what's coming down the road. Mm. Mm. So what if there's like a business out there that's like, I need to be on TikTok or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like some people just feel this pressure to like, and if it's out there, I should be on it. Mm -hmm. But that's not really, I would imagine. No, no. Yeah. I mean, again, it's to Dennis's earlier point, like maybe if your company is 16 year olds, but right. if it's, you know, his 67 year old father, if that's your client, then probably not. Yeah. We run into that a lot. TikTok is a great example because people see TikTok and they think, I can do it. Mm. What they don't realize is the actual amount of time and resourcing that goes into it. So um, similar to influencers, we'll work with an influencer and somebody will say, oh, get us an influencer. That's amazing. And we do influencer management between mm -hmm. clients. And when we sometimes come back to an influencer and say, yep, yeah, they're open and willing and this is what resourcing it will take to get that influencer, their jaw sometimes drops open because it's a non-traditional or a new form of public relations or engagement. And, you know, it may be cost prohibitive. It may be time or equipment prohibitive. And that's that's a challenge. So sometimes it's kind of opening people's eyes to the reality. Yeah, there's a lot of misunderstandings about actually what goes into it. Like influencer marketing isn't just about taking a selfie and posting it on. Like right. these are, they're real pros who work hard. Like, yeah. you know, they they hustle with, you know, getting it right, the analytics they provide, meeting with you and discussing what how they're going to present the product. Like, you know, it's not just taking a picture. Right. No. And we make sure that both sides are protected. We want our client to be protected so that somebody's not taking advantage of them in terms mm -hmm. of, how much a video should cost. And we want our service providers who we trust, um, you know, we're recommending the videographers that we trust and we know, and we're making sure that our client gets the best price. So it definitely is a lot of education and sometimes really hard conversations about that's not where your platform, that's mm. not where you should be. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I feel like, like PR, it always kind of comes back to your target audience, right? Like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. No, it definitely <laughs> does. And, and what the message is you're trying to get out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because sometimes it's not going to be accomplished. You know, if you have 
a Nova Scotia provincial court judge on TikTok, that's not where they're supposed to be. Well, I know. Uh, <laughs> like you know? Sometimes you see people like doing the the trending dances yeah. or whatever, and you're like, why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah. you know? And the other thing that I will say is it's one thing to implement a tactic, but you have to also consider the engagement after that. Mm -hmm. If your video goes viral, do you have the mm. capacity and the resourcing That's to monitor your comments? Because you can't just put stuff out no. there. You need to make sure that there's not hate going on in your comments. Is there going to be feuding and controversial opinions? Yes. But if things start to get really hairy in the comments, you need to respond to that. And it's not a response tomorrow. It is a response in the moment. And so there's, a, there's just so much to think about. And so much can get away from you so quick if you don't have kind of the right plan in place. Mm -hmm. So as we're even going through this conversation, right, there's like so many things to take care of. What is my target audience? Should I get influencers? Um, what platform should I use? Do I have the capacity to manage? And this is a question we get from business owners all the time, especially in the tourism industry, because I manage that project is, where do I start? Mm -hmm. How do I even figure out what should I do in terms of my first step? What would be your recommendation to someone just starting off? I think we'll have the same answer. Oh, you need a plan. Yeah. Yeah. And what? and so, so many people want to go to the, you know, global news or CTV mm -hmm. or get me on CBC. But that just doesn't happen like quickly unless it's a groundbreaking announcement. It can happen, mm. but then what next? You know, so y you need to clean up the house before you have company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. I love it. Yep. Yeah. And I think what's the phrase you say, Jen? It's plan to fail. Or fail, fail to plan. Yeah. Fail to plan. Thanks. And I think that's like we said, when we go in with a communication strategy or plan for a client, you can almost think of it like a work back plan. So it's okay if you want to get on global, great. What do your socials look like? Because you know media is going to go for your socials. Okay. And then you're on the media uh, interview and you mention it. How are people go going to reach you? What's the state of your website right now? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be promoting your new product if your website is not mobile friendly. So we often, it's, it's, a, it's a huge work back plan to say, are all, your, are all your ducks in a row or is your house clean? Mm -hmm. And it's not always going to be perfectly clean, but the the work gets put in to make it as good as it possibly can in that moment using your resources so that, you know, your best foot forward. And so when you finally do get in front of the media, um, you know, you have your key messages established, you know what your talking points are. Um, you've had the media training that you're mm -hmm. going to come across as an expert in your field and a trusted voice for whatever it is you're discussing. And sometimes we're just literally the cheerleader. So we have rock star clients who are so well spoken. We go over keywords. We do media training. But sometimes all they need is that familiar face on the other side of the camera to just smile and say, like, you've got this. Mm -hmm. And it just gives them the confidence that they know what they're talking about and they are the expert in the room. And there's also some, like, brokering that happens between journalists and our client, too. So, like, you know, if it's a feature story, we can get the questions, that mm -hmm. sort of thing in advance and help them prepare adequately for, for an interview. Mm -hmm. You guys are speaking my language. I don't think I've ever mentioned on this podcast before, but I was a broadcast journalist for 10 years. So like everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, you need that. You need that because I've been on the other side right. trying to deal Make with my life yeah. easier. Yeah. It's like yep. if you're going to pitch a story to me, like you need to be prepared for me to like come back and say, yes, I'd love to do this story. You know, anyways, that's well, and that's one of the things we love doing is we we love to give the the media person we're working with mm -hmm. almost the full story. Because they know that they can just say, I don't have a half, I don't have any time and I have no support. Yeah, that's so if we can give them the story and they can take it the last 5%, mm -hmm. we consider that, you know, a strong, positive relationship that we just established <laughs> there. Definitely. I agree with you. Okay, well, this is a great segue into the next question because we're talking, you know, storytelling. I guess, you know, because the tech industry can be quite um, niche. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking cybersecurity, data analytics, sometimes which complicated. Yeah, but, complicated. Yeah. So like, I guess, you know, when people, companies, businesses don't feel like they have that unique story to tell, like, what would you what would you say to that? Because I know storytelling is so big when it comes mm -hmm. to I think there's always a story to tell. Yeah. And we live in a culture where people always want to peek behind the curtain. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I think if there's no like news story you're telling, like, I think one of the good things that people love seeing on social media is like, who are your, you know, rock stars or your up and comers inside your organization? Give a brief, you know, snapshot of what a day in the life could look like. You know, you can 
profile those people on social media quite well or on your website. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, thought leadership is a big thing too. Like, um, you know, you talk about cybersecurity, like is there a day that goes by or a week that goes by in the media now that some big company hasn't been impacted by that? And so, you know, who are, or what is your expertise in that? And how can you like news jack to offer an opinion to a local journalist who might be covering the story and give, you know, the local perspective on that. And then, you know, that builds your credibility within the organization so that in three weeks time, when guess what? There's another cyber attack on another big company. I'm going to call, you know, Joanne because she's the expert here and I know she'll give me the soundbite I'm looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. What about, because again, a lot of our members, like I said at the beginning, they're doing amazing work, but they're so humble, you know, like they don't want to brag about the stuff they're doing. Like, what would you say to them? Like they should brag. I'd say, why not you? Because somebody else is going to be, and we all see people who are telling their story who aren't as qualified as you were. And you're like, why are they the expert? Yeah, exactly. You know, I think of it as like a resume building experience. Mm-hmm. Sometimes writing our own resumes, well, for some people, some people have no problem with it, but we're always going to be more humble. It's really hard to brag about yourself. Mm-hmm. And so we often will take it away and say, we have the intake, we have the conversations, and we say, we're going to walk away and we are going to tell you all of these amazing points about yourself because we can tell you don't want to you don't want to do it because you're scared you'll look you know like you're bragging we're going to do it for you and then we're going to come back and the amount of times that we have conversations with people who they're like oh my god i i didn't even realize that's how much i was doing Mm -hmm. and you and you're just like yes let's get it out there let's put that out there and um yeah and one of my favorite things about working with complicated industries or things that I really know very little about is that I have the freedom to ask the stupid questions, Mm -hmm. right? right? And so that's, you know, you learn it from, you know, the six-year-old basically perspective. And that's really how stories should be told, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. On a base, like our job is to take that complicated information, do the knowledge translation and break it down into digestible sound bites so that people, you know, like us can understand it and appreciate the work that's being done. Yeah. That's what's great about this podcast, too. I can ask stupid questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing. <laughs> Favorite. There's there's no stupid question in our world yeah. uh, because answers always come from those. Um, but we do we do work with some very high-level tech firms um, that we do have to do a lot of knowledge translation and we do writing for them. And it's like Jen said, we have to put our egos aside and say, mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about talk to me like you're six Mm. and then you write the piece and you come back and you say we're doing an accuracy check we're doing all of that and you get the hang of it you get to learn you get to learn their speak part of it what makes our job easier is when the companies that are complicated when they know themselves Mm -hmm. so when they have key messages when they know who they are as a company they know what they value Mm -hmm. that makes our lives really easy a lot easier. It's the companies that don't always know who they are. And and I don't say that as a bad thing. Startups are hard. Mm-hmm. But when you don't know who you are, you don't know what you stand for, that's when the conversations have to become a lot more in depth with us. us. And that's kind of the coaching element that comes in is we have to say, okay, well, who are you? Right. And so we're now going from having to create like, you know, a press release that has X, Y, and Z in it to now having to go three steps back to say, let's work with your CEO to figure out who your company is so that the press release makes sense. Right. So talking about thought leadership, um, how important is thought leadership in the tech industry? And what is the case for leaders to take that time and go speak at conference and workshops, especially tech industry is so busy. There is so much competition competition. Yeah, I think it's very important because in a lot of cases in the tech industry, the information or the your day-to-day work is very confidential and protected. Mm. And so it's not a lot of stuff that you can, you know, shout out to the world because um you know, you want to keep that close, play, keep your cards close to your chest. But I do think when there's an opportunity, you know, in the world, so let's just use the cybersecurity thing again, that you can offer um some insight. Um you, that's getting your voice out there. And so it may not be telling the world exactly what contracts you're working on specifically and how you're giving organizations that you support that competitive advantage. But it does share what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, in 2022, Halifax was named Canada's tech, hottest tech Mm -hmm. hub. Mm -hmm. I know, it's incredible. And outside of probably us, I didn't see much about that in the media. 
you know, we are a hot spot for tech right now. Mm. And our East Coast mentality of, you know, don't want to brag, don't want to. This is a big deal. This is how we're attracting young professionals, new immigrants, skilled immigrants from all around the world who could be going to Silicon Valley, but are choosing to make their lives in Halifax and Nova Scotia. Um, so that's how we're globalizing our local businesses too. Right. I mean, a lot of these companies have employees around the world in every time zone. Mm, and so, so yeah. when we think about thought leadership, we're often saying to people within organizations, get out there and talk about your hiring strategy. So if you feel that your company maybe isn't, um, competitive in terms of what you do, Let's talk about what you offer. Let's talk about that when you live in Halifax, you're only X number of minutes away from the beach and you can mm -hmm. raise your family in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of a lot better. If I'm working in tech and I'm living in Halifax uh, in a three bedroom house versus downtown New York in a studio apartment with my three kids, mm -hmm. those are attractive features for Nova Scotia to be here. And so our leaders in tech need to be getting out there. LinkedIn. Thought leadership on LinkedIn, that's the bread and butter of that platform. It is. And when you see a leader of a company, a CEO, newsjacking, commenting on an article, quick little one or two sentences, um, or saying something about the company, congratulating work, work uh, coworkers, we all see that. Mm -hmm. And that shows that that CEO is in touch with what's going on. That's a place I want to work. Mm -hmm. And in terms of conferences, I mean, that's where your industry leaders come to network right so yeah. um if you're not there your competition is mm -hmm. so well i think it's we always um talk about like you know it's who you know but it's also who knows you so if you're not in that space especially in the in the niche market like tech people need to know who you are you can know five people but at the end of the day if 25 people know you one of them is going to think of you the next time they need the project and you could win that project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we often say, like, just from a communications perspective, um, the tactics that you employ, it's about creating as many touch points in your market as possible. So a conference is, is one, you know, thought leadership on LinkedIn is another. Just, just having social media, a really updated website, like those are just the multiple touch points that you can put out there. One of my favorite and kind of least used tactics for thought leadership is our university and college population, specifically in Nova Scotia. We have a hidden, not a hidden, we have a gem of a province. We are small geographically and population wise with a lot of post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. There is no better time than to get in front of a hungry uh, crowd that can be inspired. They're studying there's no better time to go in than to give a talk or uh, invite university students or college students to your workplace to show them what you can do, to show them what's possible, and quite frankly, to convince them to stay in Nova Scotia and make a make a go of their career here. So that would be my my recommendation: is get before the young people, even high schools, I guess, at this point. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, you've definitely made the case for it. Uh, <laughs> if anyone was, you know, not doing it before, hopefully they'll, you know, consider it now just getting out there and sharing their expertise because it's so important, like you said. Um, well, we have made it to our last question, which isn't quite a question, but, you know, the floor is yours. Is there anything kind of exciting coming up at Up that you'd like to share or, you know, what are you excited for? Just looking, looking ahead to the near future. There's always lots in the hopper. Um, we have we have some projects that we're really fortunate that year after year we get some reoccurring projects that are really fun because we can see the the evolution of the project um, because we know it. It can get kind of meatier each year. Um, it's tricky to talk a lot about our projects For due sure. to kind of client privilege. Um, but we have some really fun things. We we touch on a whole bunch of different areas. We yeah. have some Indigenous clients and some Indigenous work coming up. Um, aside, NAG will be super exciting. And mm. So we're hoping that in some capacity we'll have some touch point with NAG, North American Indigenous Games in, hosted in yeah. Halifax this we're, summer. We'll be there cheering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if not anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... 
it's a great time to live in Halifax and be in yeah. Nova Scotia. I mean, we, you know, we're exploding on a lot of fronts for the better and um, events are really oh and that oh yeah yeah we're excited to be back doing some events like that was a drought (laughs) for sure last september was our first one post covid and and it's it's shaky knees but it was great and nice to see people and just um really tap into the energy of a crowd and people you know i've missed it and are just really excited to get back together and to be sharing um ideas and energy um in person I think one, you know, one thing that we're doing now, um, we are trying to walk the talk. So we ourselves are going through a new website that's going to be launched over the summer. Um, So we are trying to work on our business as well. And, you know, scalability, diversifying the colleagues and coworkers that we have um, as other entrepreneurs and business owners. And so right now, I think we're definitely in a time where... um, we're starting to, you know, refine what we're what we're doing and who we are, and and ultimately getting our message out there as well. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Well, it's exciting time. That is. So, for our listeners who have heard everything you had to say and they want to become the thought leader in the industry, or they realize how much they need you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. So people can reach out to us uh, through our website at uppublicrelations.ca or on social media at up your PR. Yeah. So you can find us, send us a yeah. DM or an email and we have an inquiry form on our yeah. website. So um, it's monitored. Even and moment. even if you just want to say hello, like mm. we often loved just, you know, meeting other people in our field and them saying, hey, this is what I do. We love that. So it's always great to have. Yeah. Including any freelancers because we're always yeah. looking for extra resources okay. too. So anybody that's working in the design space or, you know, wants to some advice, would be happy to chat. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Well, I'm super excited for you guys. Can't wait to check out the new website when it goes live and for, you know, all the exciting stuff you've got coming on down the pipe. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. Thanks for tuning in to All Hands on Tech. Interested in learning more? Visit us on our website at www.digitalnovascotia.com. We'll see you next time. This has been a Podstarter production. production.